Our friends at Perla are big proponents of simple, long-term investing, and now they're rewarding you for being a long-term investor too. Perla investors receive points every time they fund their account and invest. The more points you earn, the higher your chances to win one of their weekly prizes or the big prize at the end of the month. To get started, check out the competition terms and conditions and open your Perla account today using the links in your podcast player. This episode of the Australian Finance Podcast is proudly supported by GlobalX ETFs and the launch of the US100 ETF, better known as N100. N100 offers Australian investors exposure to 100 of the largest non-financial companies listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. N100 focuses on innovation-driven companies, providing a growth tilt to core portfolio holdings. You can learn more about N100, including reading the PDS and TMD by clicking the link in your podcast player or by simply heading to globalxetfs.com.au. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. Delene, welcome onto the Australian Finance Podcast today. Hi, Kate. Thanks for having me. Now, it's fantastic to have you here as a qualified financial advisor to talk about everyone's favourite topic, superannuation. Well, it's my favourite topic, so. (laughs) (laughs) I'd hope so. I know a lot of listeners have been asking questions about superannuation and also questions about talking to financial advisors because we always mention getting personal advice, but often there's a bit of a gap between how do you actually get that advice? And we've just done a podcast recently on how to actually find an advisor, but I'd love to talk to you a little bit about maybe what you do as a financial advisor and specifically around that superannuation topic and what advisors can do to help set listeners up as well with their superannuation. Mm. Um, So, yeah, I've been a financial advisor for almost 10 years and I have for a big part of that time looked after people who were focused on uh, retirement, so pre-retirees and retirees. So superannuation did form a big part of that advice and that's because uh, for most people by the time they get to that sort of age in their 50s and 60s, they that most of their wealth is inside superannuation besides their family home. So uh, that's why it becomes an area of interest and an area of focus. Um, And the reason financial planners love superannuation so much as well is because it is such a tax effective way to save for retirement. So there can be tax savings on the way contributing into super, there can be tax savings on the earnings, and it can be tax free when we start drawing money out of it after 60 years old and start living on it. So there's a lot of great tax benefits around um, superannuation, which is why we like it. And um, in terms of uh, like, yeah, how does that work in the whole financial plan um, scheme of things? So a financial planner, um, as you, as the listeners may have heard on the, your previous um, podcast episode, um, a financial planner helps the client set goals. It's really common for people to come to me and not really know what their goals are. And so I guess I kind of help them with a framework and try and work out what those goals are. And then we work out a plan uh, on how to achieve those goals. And sometimes those goals can be financial or lifestyle. Um, but even if they're lifestyle based, we kind of need the financial backing to achieve those lifestyle goals. Um, And so some of the areas of advice that I assist with, I only give comprehensive advice. So there are some financial planners that will specialise in particular areas. They might just give advice on insurance or might just give advice on um, superannuation and retirement planning. I look at really comprehensive advice um, and that's where I look at things like somebody's cash flow and their budgeting, um, you know, non-super investments, their superannuation and retirement planning, estate planning, risk management like um, their insurance and debt management. So really looking at the whole financial wheel, as we like to call it. Um, And I guess financial planning is really a balancing act around living a good life now, but also saving for our future. It is a balancing act and a financial planner can really help with those trade-off discussions too and kind of work backwards around what do we need in the future and what can we spend now and try to get that right, strike that right balance. 
Mm, and that balance is really hard. It's something even I struggle with because the, using your super and that retirement date can feel so far far away. And I guess working backwards is a good strategy there because you can kind of plot, well, what does one need for a comfortable retirement and what does that look like? And working back, because otherwise it's like, oh yeah, I've got a little bit of money in my super, but it's not actually adding up to much maybe in your twenties until it starts to snowball down the track. Yeah, definitely. And I think a lot of it comes down to like the emotional and um, behavioral finance side of things as well, where, um, we think we'll like we're really good at saying we're going to do better in the future so we'll we'll eat better tomorrow we'll start exercising tomorrow we'll save more tomorrow we're really good at doing that um so it is yeah trying to find that balance but then also you would have heard a lot about people um where they've it happens all the time for me i'll see them at retirement and tell them they can afford to retire and they can stop work now but they still don't feel like they have enough and they'll just keep working that one year more or whatever it is. Like they just really struggle to let go sometimes and and are really nervous about running out. So, yeah, definitely um, a balancing act and I also struggle with it. So I'm not immune to it. (laughs) And if we're maybe a few decades away from retirement, how can we view super's place in our own finances? Because sometimes it feels like it's something that you can just leave till later. Yeah. Um, well, superannuation, it can. I think it can be a controversial topic because if you're a PAYG employee and you've got contributions being paid by your employer, it can feel like a good thing. But if you're somebody who's self-employed or um, you're taking breaks from the workforce and you've got no super contributions and it's a matter of making your own contributions uh, or putting food on the table, like that can be that balancing act as well. Um, the superannuation system, it's not a perfect system. Uh, I don't know if there is a perfect system out there, but it has been a really important part of Australia's social infrastructure because it has helped reduce the reliance on things like the age pension and it's allowed people to um, retire with more dignity. And so if we don't have our own personal savings or our personal investments like superannuation, it really does limit our choices later on. And so what what I mean by that is um, if we don't have our own savings or our own home and things like that, we are forced to live on the age pension, which is um, pretty low, I think. Um, And it means that yeah, we're limited to choices. And the research does show um, as well, because the superannuation is just one part of the whole retirement system. There's three different pillars to the retirement system. And um, if we don't have our own home, which is one part of the, the retirement system that the government looks at, um, the research does show that people that are renting and those that are involuntary, involuntarily retired before the age pension age. So what I mean by that is people who suffer illness or disability and are forced to retire sooner than they had planned to, they typically do have poorer outcomes in retirement and they are at a higher risk of poverty. So if we want to have a better outcome, we need to take control of our financial future. And because superannuation has such great tax advantages, that's why it plays a part in the overall scheme of things. Mm. And I'm sure you've had many conversations with with clients in the past who come in and maybe don't actually want to talk about the concept of retirement because that's for future future you to sort out. How do you tackle that idea? Because I know we struggle, especially as young people, thinking that we'll ever get old and thinking that our super will therefore be really important. Yeah, I... Don't, I don't know if it's probably because of my profession that I don't actually find people don't want to talk about super. I actually find people are really interested in learning more because it is quite a complex system. Um, so I might be a bit different to what you're seeing out there, but I'll find friends or like randoms I've met will just start talking to me about their superannuation and tell me how much they've got in there with completely me unprovoking them to do that. So um, it probably does come down to yeah what I do for my job. <laughs> um, well, because I give comprehensive advice, it really does form part of the overall scheme of things because um, a lot of people, an easy way, I guess, to lead into it is a lot of people want to save tax. No one likes paying taxes, even though it's necessary to make our economy run smoothly. 
Um, so a big part of it is looking at, well, we can have the same investment inside or outside of super, but we'll typically earn a better return when that money is invested inside super because of the tax benefits. So um, typically people are more interested in superannuation when you start talking about the tax benefits. Um, but it is definitely a trade-off because you are locking that money away until at least 60 years old or until you meet a condition of release. Um so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Because I want to talk a little bit after this about what the what retirement actually looks like and how much we actually need in our super because uh, we often see those charts floating around of how much you need at each age to be on track and sometimes that can feel really disheartening. But yeah. maybe just to start with, um, to pique some interest, are you able to talk about the difference that small contributions to your super can really have over your lifetime? Yeah, I actually had, I've got a real life example that I can talk about here. I had a client that I met with recently, just last week, and she's 30 years old. She's currently got $28,000 in super and she is super self-conscious about being behind with her super. So I say behind with uh, inverted commas. Um, so yeah, she's self-employed, doesn't have contributions going in, but we ran a quick projection. If she just makes a $20 per week contribution into her super, it's projected to be worth about 338000 at age 67, which is when her age pension age is. So that's only made up of about $38,000 of her own contributions. And then the rest being over 270,000 is made up of investment returns that have compounded over that um, 37 years. So it does come down to starting early if you can. And even if it's just small amounts, it can really make a big difference at retirement. Like 338,000, um, like I can't remember what those choice numbers were. I've got them on the um, screen here. So, well, it says um, if you're 65 to 69 years old and you want $38,000 a year in retirement income, which is that medium level, you need $258,000 um, in retirement. So, yeah, I mean, it, all those small differences can make a difference in the long term. What it comes down to, though, is you are really relying on getting to age pension age to be able to draw some money from the age pension, draw some money from from super to complement that. Um, if you want to retire before age pension age, you need to be self-funded. And so that means you need to live 100% on your own investments. So again, it comes down to choice and what you want your retirement to look like. Um, and I guess leading into those numbers with choice and as far, at the end of the day, like they are just guides and if everyone's retirement is going to look different because everyone's going to have different goals on what they want to do, like do you want to travel overseas every year or multiple times a year or are you more of a homebody that you'd rather stay home and plot around the house and the garden and, you know, spend time with kids or grandkids or, um, you know, it kind of just depends what you want your retirement to look like. And so when we see those numbers on choice and um, as far they're just guides and it's important to really understand what is the assumptions behind those numbers because everyone's situation will be different. So what investment rates are they using? Is that aligned with what your expectations are or your risk profile can handle? Um, what is the income that they're suggesting that you would need to have in like, is that in line with what you're actually spending? It is really common for me to see people, um, Re coming up to retirement and they're spending a lot more than what those numbers might suggest. And so it's around asking them, well, what's going to change? Are you going to like drastically change your lifestyle or, you know, so it, it always just depends. And I know everyone hates that saying, but it, it does. Yeah, no, it's interesting because I was at a, a money event for another podcast on Friday night and they were asking the question of, should I, put the money, uh, additional contributions in my super that's locked away for a long time or just enjoy the money now while I've got it. And really the answer did come out. It depends too, yeah. especially on what your life circumstances are right now. And if you have some of that spare money to put into super and you're happy to lock that away. And But it was very interesting to see how many people were actually making small uh, additional contributions to their super on a regular basis, even if it was just $20, because I feel like 10 years ago, that probably was less common. 
I agree. I think so as well. But I think having events like COVID, um, which we've actually physically physically experienced as younger people, uh, whereas like the GFC, we were probably a bit, a bit younger, didn't really feel the impacts as much. So things like COVID, I think, might have scared a lot of people um, in my experience because they've realised that, yeah, you could lose your job or like something could happen to your health or you just don't know what tomorrow will bring. So I think like health is a big one. Like you don't know whether you'll be able to be um, healthy enough to work all the way to age pension age. And, yeah, disability support pensions in, in Australia, like they're not great. So uh, it just does come down to choice, uh, like what you what choices you want to be able to make. And I guess we are lucky that we live in Australia so that we always do have these safety nets in place. We've got public health systems, we've got age pension, social security, but it does take away your choices, which is what I keep coming back to. <laughs> yeah. So someone came to you and said they wanted to have a comfortable retirement. They've got many decades to go. Uh, potentially they don't want to rely on the age pension and be able to self-fund their super. How would you work backwards from there and working out what that goal looks like? Yeah, it always comes down to cash flow as the first point with any financial plan. So what are you earning? What are you spending? Um, because that is really like the foundation of any financial plan. And then we kind of look at uh, some of the other parts of the the pie, <laughs> other slices. So we've got, uh, you know, debt, for example. So if we've got a mortgage, well, what's our goal around that? Do we want to have that cleared by retirement and how will we do that? And doing a bit of stress testing, um, you know, assuming that the rates are going to go up, can we fund that? So making sure we've got plenty of buffers there. Uh, also looking at things like... Um, yeah, well, like what other super, well, sorry, what other investments we have. And if we want to retire earlier, we kind of need to have a second bucket of money for our retirement to live on before we can have our superannuation kick in. Um, so there's those kinds of things. And then we also need to think about other like foundational backup plan pieces around like insurance and estate planning. So uh, estate planning is a big one when it comes to retirement planning. So people in their 50s and 60s, it is really important to make sure your estate plan is reviewed because as you get older, you may lose capacity and not be able to actually review that in the future. Um, so that's always a big piece. And also the fact that we've usually saved up a fair bit by that point in terms of super and home equity. So we just want to make sure those um, assets are flowing to the right people and are tax effective as well. Um, so superannuation doesn't automatically form part of your estate. And that's why we've got to have a superannuation beneficiary nomination, but there's a few different types and there's a few different ways it can be paid out. So that's kind of why that estate planning piece is really important with super. And then um, also with the insurance side of things, it's important because um, there's no point like building a house if you don't have the right foundation in place. And it's the same with your financial plan. If you don't have the right foundations, which is insurance forms part of that, that foundation, that, that, that um, you know, the financial house, the, your, your financial plan can cr come crumbling down really quickly if you don't have a plan B in place. Um, so, yeah, that's how that kind of all interlinks. And because a lot of people do choose to have their some of their insurance paid from their super balance, that can impact their long-term retirement savings as well. So that's why I choose to give comprehensive advice because it all kind of interlinks, as you can see. Mm. Mm. And if you're just a normal PAYG employee, maybe working for four decades and potentially putting a small contribution in on a monthly basis, but maybe not, is that still like a valid path to reaching a comfortable retirement or do you have to think about putting more and more additional contributions into super to kind of, if you just want to retire off that nest egg? Mm. So the everyday millionaires that I've seen have typically been people that have, like you said, just been PAYG, had contributions their entire working life. And because of that consistency into their super, they've been able to retire with very comfortable super balances uh, at the moment. And the thing I think we should also remember is that superannuation has just turned 30 years old on the 1st of July um, this year. Well, I should say the compulsory super system. Um, and so when superannuation was first introduced um, back in 1992, it was only a compulsory 3 or 4%. 
And now we're at 10.5%. So that's been slowly increasing over time. And it is planned to increase up to 12% over the next few years as well. So what we need to remember is that the people that are retiring now with these comfortable balances, they haven't even had the full 10 or 12% going into their super for their whole working life. So it has... Um, it is still it's maturing now and if we're in our 30s we've got um or 40s we've still got a long time before we can access our super so even if we do feel behind now there is plenty of opportunity to still save for our retirement it's not too late because i know a lot of people feel like it's too late and they're really nervous about not having enough and that's absolutely not the case yeah, I know we get some listeners who who write in and say they've only started thinking about their finances maybe in their 40s or their 50s and uh, is it too late? And most guests will say, no, it is absolutely not too late. But is there anything, if someone's looking at their super now, is there anything that you would suggest that they have a look at if they haven't sort of checked in with their super for before or for a very long time? So I did mention earlier on that the superannuation is one pillar of the retirement system. So the three major pillars to the retirement system is superannuation savings, the age pension, and then also voluntary savings, which includes home equity. So what I've seen sometimes with people in that are at retirement, and maybe it is a bit late for them, most of your listeners, you know, 30s, 40s, even 50s, they will still have time to turn things around and make changes. But somebody who's literally come to me at 65 years old saying I'm going to retire next week, um, they've kind of left it a bit late. Uh, But there's usually still choices available for them. And um, that's because of these three pillars. So, superannuation, we can start accessing that from 60 years old. Um, There's no retirement age in Australia. So we can start accessing from 60. That's our preservation age. Um, But age pension is only at 67 for most of the listeners here, which means there is a gap between 60 and 67 that you need to be self-funded. And if you want to retire before 60, you need to have your own voluntary savings as well to kick in beforehand. Um, And then when it comes to the home ownership and the voluntary savings, so home ownership, a lot of people forget that... um, there's a lot of equity in our in, in homes these days if we've owned the home for a long time or even if we've owned it for the last couple of years. And um, I did have a statistic here that said that people over the age of 65, the majority of their wealth is in their home. That's where rather than their super. So if somebody is coming to me quite late, uh, we can always talk about what are the options around accessing some equity from the home is that we downsize or do we you know look at a reverse mortgage or like there are options available so um, the other levers we can pull when it comes to a retirement plan is spending less or earning more in order to save more before we get to retirement so that's where it comes down to that cash flow discussion again Um, some of the other levers we can pull are delaying goals. So if we want to retire at 55, but we're just not going to have enough in our voluntary savings bucket, then can we work part-time from 55 to 60? Or if we want to retire at 60, but we can't afford to, can we work part-time or do we just work one extra year or whatever it is? So there's options around delaying the goals as well, which will allow you to save more and spend less of your savings as well. Um, And then some other things we can do is adjust our expectations in retirement. So, you know, if we want to have these big lavish holidays in retirement, well, maybe we agree that we do that every second or third year instead of every year, or we might do them for the first five years, but then we dial them back. Um, So there's different options around that, around the goals. And then also looking at, well, how's the money invested? Um, If we do have a long time frame to invest, we can typically look at uh, investing more aggressively, but that's not always appropriate for somebody with a shorter time frame or somebody who doesn't have the risk appetite for that. So there's a, a bunch of levers that we can pull and it really does depend on, yeah, like your age, your your income and your expenses and what your overall values and goals are for the future. Yeah. And I guess if you have the time to think all of this through maybe a decade or even more before you get to that retirement age, you'll have more flexibility. And uh, when you get to that point, so you might not have to 
uh, pull as many levers because you've thought Correct. it sort of through a little bit more. So if you know you want to go on a, a European trip every couple of years and spend a lot of money there, well, maybe you have to sort of plan that a little bit more into your super. Yeah, because um, everyone's probably heard that saying the or the Albert Einstein eighth wonder of the world, like compound interest <laughs> um, is the eighth wonder. And so you really want to start making your money work for you rather than you working for your money. So the earlier you start, the better your long term will look like. But you know, coming back to well, what what's um, what can we spend now and, and not delay for the future? Like that really comes down to all those that goal that goal planning because you don't want to put off things that you can do now and it, like if you can afford to. Because I have seen people get to retirement and they have delayed you know travel or delayed spending time with family and they thought they would do that when they retire, but then their health unfortunately mm. doesn't allow them to do that. So that's why it is really important to make sure you're living a fulfilling life now I'm not saying be YOLO (laughs) and spend all your money and not think about the future and use that as an excuse but it is around building goals that are realistic and doing things that make you happy now because you just don't know what the future will hold in terms of health family you know those kinds of things um yeah yeah and if things come up in your life and maybe you take some significant time out of the workforce because you're a single parent raising kids, maybe you've got an illness, any other of those spanners that life mm. throws at you, sometimes you do get in a position where you might not have enough uh, at retirement. And if you're thinking ahead now, is there any way you can uh, either close the gap if you know this might happen in the adv- in advance, like you know, okay, in my 30s I might spend some time out of the workforce not that you can always plan for these things, but do you have any suggestions there? Yeah, well, in regards to, because they're, they're kind of different topics there. So if it was like an involuntary um, leave, such as illness or disability, um, that's where it's really important to make sure we've got that insurance insurances in place. And uh, we have a significant underinsurance issue in Australia with personal insurances like life and disability insurance. Um, so that's a different topic. Uh, yeah, making sure you've got the right insurances would would be my suggestion on dealing with that because and, and the whole point of insurance is you hope you never have to use it, but it's there as a backup so that you do have enough money if you couldn't work again or you couldn't work for a period of time. And that's where like income protection or trauma insurance would kick in. Um, When it comes down to taking time out of the workforce because you're caring for family members, like like you mentioned, uh, a parent or you've got elderly parents that you want to care for, those sorts of things. Um, So the good news is that the modelling suggests that in the future the gap between men and women's superannuation balances are closing and that's due to a couple of reasons. So first of all, we've got the super system maturing now. So as I mentioned, we've got higher contributions going in now. And also there's a lagging effect because of the women's um, workforce participation. So that has increased over time, which means if women are working more and participating more in the workforce, they've got more contributions being saved into their super. So those sorts of things are definitely helping close the gap but it's not going to close completely. The other thing that's helping with closing that gap is around um, voluntary savings, whether that's into superannuation or in another type of vehicle. Um, And what we see with the research is that women typically make more voluntary contributions than men. So we see them making higher amounts and um, for longer periods of time as well. So if we know we're going to have a gap in our work career, um, we can plan and start contributing in advance. Um, If we're on leave, there's still options around contributing into super or other savings if we can afford to do that. I know it can be quite tight with um, if you've got, you know, elderly parents that are sick or you've got young children and things like that. So it can sometimes be um, a bit tight at that point. Uh, but there's also options around splitting super contributions. Um, so if if you haven't heard of that before, Google contribution splitting. Um, this is a really underutilised strategy, I think, where if you've got two people in a 
um, in a couple, one person is continuing to work and a higher income earner, they can split some of their contributions over to their spouse's super who may have a lower balance or may have a lower income to help equalise the balances. Um, But then even if we don't do any of those things before or during that leave of absence, and we look at when we go back to work, it's like, like I mentioned, it's never too late to start. So um, just I think being aware is a, a big part of that and being engaged and then looking at, well, what's your next step? And even if it's just a small amount, like I mentioned, it can make a big difference. Yeah. And what about the worst case scenario? I know we don't often like to talk about that and we hope that we'll be able to make sure all of our finances will be in track (laughs) to support us in the future. But what happens if you get to retirement and you just, you do not have enough super there? Yeah. Well, this comes back to that choice thing that we were like about having choices. Um, And if we get to retirement, we have no savings, we have no house, we have no super. There is the age pension, which kicks in at 67 years old, um, which is around $38,000 for a couple and for a single is about $26,000 a year. So it's not a a huge amount, um, but it is there as a backup. And um, I think I might have mentioned earlier that the reality is that people who are renting in retirement and those that are involuntarily retiring before age pension age or even at age pension um, age, they are at a higher risk of those poorer outcomes. And there is things like Commonwealth rent assistance, but what we find is that rent assistance is far below what the actual cost of rent is. So, yeah, I mean, it's not... It's not great. We are lucky that we have a backup system, but it's not, it's not going to give you choices and it's not going to be significant. So uh, what I find is people at that point, well, I mean, I'm not really advising those sorts of people because they can't really afford to get financial advice, unfortunately. Um, And there's really limited options if you have no savings and it's just you're getting the age pension. Like that's what it is. You just have to learn to manage your money within that income. Um, So the earlier we can start, as I keep saying, earlier we can start the better and um, it it just gives you choices really. Yeah, I think that's really important, especially if you are a listener in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, you do have, you still have time to make changes with the direction of your super. And I I think that's the main thing I wanted to sort of get out of this conversation is actually just saying if you spend a bit of time and attention and actually checking in with your super, you can have a huge impact um, over the course of multiple decades. Yeah, definitely. So looking at whether you're in a good um, quality super fund, low fees, um, history of strong returns, we can't predict what the future will have, but we can look at, you know, has it performed well in the past? Understanding how it's invested is really important. And then looking at what contributions are going in. um, If you've got insurance premiums coming out of that, making sure you understand what that impact is going to have on your overall savings. A lot of people, um, when they're using projection tools online, they've forget that part of it so that's really important to I guess play up uh, to incorporate um and yeah just making sure you've got those other pieces tidied up like those foundation pieces as I mentioned with the beneficiary nomination and insurance making sure we're sufficiently covered there yeah and I just had a few questions from our listeners Uh, I don't know if I sent them through to you, so these might be on the spot, but one of them was whether it's okay for partners to have their super with the same super fund, like both people Mm. are with Australian Super or Host Plus. Mm. It's an interesting one because I I do get that um, question as well. What we need to remember is superannuation is potentially just one part of that overall pie, so it's just one pie pie slice. And so what other investments do we have outside of those super funds, um, because what it comes down to is diversification. We can diversify in a number of different ways. So we can diversify through different asset classes. We can diversify geographically. So Australia only makes up 2 to 3% of the world markets. So that's why it's important to diversify internationally as well. Um, and then within those different asset classes, we can diversify through through different industries and sectors and different fund managers as well. So if we did have two different super funds, um, I mean, you don't really get 
fee savings by being with the same super fund. Uh, there's nothing wrong with being with the same super fund, but I can also understand why some people might want to have different funds in order to diversify um, against those products well, with those products as well um, because different fund managers, um, so superannuation is a fund of funds, so they invest in other funds other managed funds and ETFs and things like that. And so they might all have different um, yeah, track records, different thematics, different styles in general. So um, it can be a strategy um, because we're not going to save fees by being with the one super fund. Um, but sometimes depending on the strategies you employ, so for example, if we're doing a contribution splitting strategy every year, it might make it easier if we're in the same super fund, uh, but not necessarily. So there, there can be reasons why we are with the same fund and reasons why we're not with the, the same fund. Everything has a trade-off discussion. So it's just around working out, well, what, like understanding the risks um, and what's important to you and then working out which one is right. And um, I guess the biggest thing before anybody makes any changes to their superannuation, I just want to stress that uh, it is important to consider your insurance, as I've mentioned a few times, because I've seen people roll out of super funds into another fund um, and their insurance they already had in place is cancelled and uh, they might get new insurance in their new super fund, but that might not actually pay out if they've had some other health conditions that have ar arisen in the last couple of years. So it is important um, like not to just yeah, move your super fund around a lot. I actually had that question yesterday from a client. She said, um, how often do I need to change my super fund? And my answer was like, hopefully never. Like once you've got your right, the super structure mm. right, like hopefully you never have to change it. Um, and I think the 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 recent like my gov um, changes to the portal where you're allowed to consolidate your funds really easily. It's been good in some ways, but also very dangerous in other ways because people are rolling funds together without considering those insurances and might be cancelling cover that might not be able to get anywhere else in the future. So, yeah, there's kind of like an order when we're looking at a financial plan and um, the insurance, I would say, comes before the super stuff because you need to make sure that's in place first before you start rolling super around or changing that too much. Yeah, I guess that's one of the, the downsides of, all this technology making it super easy and accessible and your super fund might, I have seen my super fund, it sends you an email saying, hey, we noticed you've got another super account. If you just click this button, you can yeah. consolidate it. Um, and it's making it very easy to potentially combine your super funds without having a full think through of the insurance. And do you actually want to combine that super fund? And is that the right direction you want to go in? So, yeah. uh, so pros and cons to having all this yeah. technology. Um, but yeah, that was actually the second listener question, which was what should um, they consider before changing super funds? So you, you answered that with insurance. Is there any other things you would add to that? Um, I think it's also just being aware, not ch trying to chase returns as well. So like if you can see your super fund has consistently underperformed, you know, every year after every time period, then, you know, you may want to consider changing. But if it's just having a bad year, we'll have a look at this. Is the other super fund also having a bad year? So right now everybody's basically down in the last 12 months. Every super fund's in a negative space. Um, so you could be just looking at your super and thinking, well, I'm going to switch because they're doing rubbish, but everyone else might be doing rubbish yeah. as well. So <laughs> it's important just to, like, make sure you're, you've, you've got your eyes wide open and don't have blinkers on and just focusing on that one product. Yeah, the, the one-year returns especially, and it can be a little bit tricky because different super funds will have one-year return as of 30th of July 2022, and one might be as of the end of December 2021. And so you're looking at very different one-year figures. Definitely. And that was um, that's something I was talking about with another client yesterday, actually, when we were looking at a couple of different super funds where on, on the websites, um, they're all reported as different um, dates. <laughs> Yeah, nah, there's there's a lot of things to think about. And I guess that's why it is, if you have a bit more super, it is a good idea to get professional advice or even talking to your super fund. Some super funds do offer advice services as well. And I guess that's a good thing about, if you think a bit more about super, we're thinking about how we can look after future us. And um, someone suggested that I uh, get 
you know, those face apps where you can see yourself in 60 oh, yeah, years yeah. time. <laughs> like I should look at that every time I add money to the super and go, what am I'm doing this for future Kate. So that's hilarious. I, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> And if people wanted to learn more about Super, maybe get in touch with you or check out some other resources, where would you suggest they go? Uh, So if they want to learn more about me, um, my main social media platform is Instagram. So it's at Muzzy Wealth. um, And I've got my website, which I don't have any like blogs or anything on there yet, (laughs) maybe one day. Um, So that's where I share most of my things on social media. Um, But yeah, other great resources. uh, I really do like what ASIC's Money Smart website has to offer. So I do think that's a great starting point. Um, And yeah, speak to your super fund as well as um, you mentioned there's some super funds will offer some basic um, financial advice. They won't look at your whole situation usually, just your super fund in isolation. So it is important that you remember it's like going to um, a Honda dealership. They're only going to talk about Hondas. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, it can be a good starting point to get some more, like, information and um, just general information. Um, otherwise, if somebody wants to book a 15-minute um, free phone call with me, they can do that through my website, which is muzzywealth.com.au. And uh, even if I'm not the right fit, I can definitely refer that person to different um, resources or professionals. Sometimes people will book in with me, but what they actually need is a mortgage broker or mm. they will be more suited to somebody else's financial advice services. So I'm happy to point them in that right direction as well. Ah, oh, that's good to hear because sometimes it can be really hard to work out where you should actually go. You've got a problem, but you're not quite sure the specialist to fix it. Definitely. Yeah, I'm happy to um, just have a 15-minute call and kind of help pinpoint whether it's me or somebody else. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the finance podcast today and unpacking superannuation a little bit more. And I hope listeners realize that maybe just a few changes and spending a little bit of time today can have a big impact over the course of their life. Yeah, thanks for having me. And I'm, I'm really happy that people want to know more about superannuation because it is something I am passionate about and um, I find it really interesting. So it's, it makes me happy that others want to know more about it as well. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining me again. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast, where our mission is to improve the financial futures of all Australians. If you'd like to learn more, create a free account at rusk.com.au forward slash account to download free episode workbooks, bonus resources, and take our amazing free personal finance courses. You can also join our online community by following the link in the description. If you enjoyed the show, what we'd love is for you to leave us a snappy review on iTunes. And you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Rask Australia. Kate and I are also on both of those channels. Finally, if you have any feedback, suggestions for episodes or guests to come on the show, or you just have a question for us, shoot us an email at podcast at rask.com.au. This podcast was proudly sponsored by InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginner Investors. Build your investing confidence for only $49.50. Learn what it takes to be a successful investor with InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginners. This online course is self-paced over three months with live weekly webinars designed to help you achieve your financial goals and create wealth. To start your investing journey today, head to investsmart.com.au bootcamp or simply click the link in your podcast player.